Hello, my name is Dave Pasquale. I'm the owner of Pasquale Aviation. And today we're going to do a landing gear rigging inspection on this 1960 Beach Debonair. In preparation for the landing gear inspection, I have the airplane supported on a jack. I am using a custom made beach jack. Um, there are other options available. The important thing to keep in mind is that the inboard landing gear doors do not interfere with the jack. Um, obvious damage could result to the landing gear system. I also have this power supply connected directly to the battery. This is a Concord BC 9000 uh, battery charger and power supply. Uh, that's really important when you're running the landing gear. If you don't have sufficient power, uh, the landing gear rigging is going to be, it's going to appear to be off when you run the landing gear. So to prevent that, you have to have a power supply connected to the battery. This one here puts out 25 amps and it's set for 14 volts since this is a 14 volt airplane. So on to our inspection. One of the first checks I do during the landing gear inspection, once the airplane's up on jacks, is the dynamic brake adjustment. Uh, what we're looking for is there's a sector gear in the gearbox that rotates 180 degrees and the electric motor has a dynamic brake that stops the motor when it hits the limit switches. And, you know, the idea here is to have that motor stop the landing gear before the internal sector gear hits the end of its travel. Uh, so what we're checking is we want to check and make sure that the there is a clearance between the internal stop on that sector gear and the internal stop in the in the gearbox and the way we do that is with the emergency hand crank so on this airplane this is a 12 volt system it has a green painted gearbox which uh, later 24 volt systems are supposed to have the 20 or are supposed to have a white painted gearbox um, color can be a little misleading if it's if the gearbox has been out and been overhauled uh, sometimes people will paint it the wrong color. So uh, what I do is I look for 12 or 24 volt and generally the 12 volt is going to be the 1 8 to 1 quarter turn and the 24 volt will be the 5 8 to 3 quarter turn. Um, that in my, at least my thought process is the larger clearance is desired for the 24 volt system since it's moving a whole lot faster. Uh, but in any case, this is a 12 volt airplane and we're looking for one eighth to one quarter turn on the dynamic brake. So what we're gonna do is we'll extend the handle and you'll you get it here, it clicks into place. That's engaged into the gearbox. And we're gonna look at the nut right here. If I hold my thumb right there and mark my, use my fingernail to index the shaft on the, the gearbox, I'm gonna turn this hand crank in the counterclockwise direction. So that's going to be the same as if you're trying to extend the gear using the hand crank. So you're going to turn it this way. And we're going to turn it until it reaches the internal stop of the of the landing gear. So I'm going to mark it here with my thumbnail and then I'm going to turn the crank and we'll see here as I come around right there I hit the internal stop and that's a quarter turn. So this, this setup is good. I'll do it again here. I moved it back to where it was. And you can see I'm in line. And you just turn the hand crank until it hits the internal stop. And that's right where we're at, a quarter turn. So then bring the hand crank back to its location, disengage it, and stow it. Uh, make sure anytime you're doing maintenance on the airplane, before you run the landing gear electrically, always check to make sure this is stowed. Uh, if it's extended and, and engaged, it can damage the gearbox if it contacts the, the carpet or something. And that'll lead you to have to pull the gearbox out and do a teardown. And we don't want to get involved in that. If you're an airplane owner, you want to make sure that that handle is stowed before you take off. Um, certainly, you want to check it coming out of maintenance. On the later airplanes that have a plastic cover over the spar carry through, that cover sometimes gets installed and covers over the handle, uh, which would make it impossible for you to deploy the landing gear in the event of an electrical failure. 
So, uh, you know, just use some caution around this, this handle and uh, we'll move on to the next check. We're looking at the top of the spar carry through. As you can see down through the access covers which have been removed and the seats, you know, sit on top of this. You can see here this rod and this rod over here are the main gear actuator rods. Uh, the landing gear box is located in the center here. Your up and down limit switches are over here on the left hand side. The, uh, this here and this rod here are the inboard gear door actuator rods. And then they go from this idler arm out to the gear door and then over here this idler arm out. Underneath the, the main gear push rod is the um, up lock cable. I don't know if you can see that when I push it over to the side. That's the right main gear up lock cable and then the left main gear up lock cable is over here. Uh, the nose gear door uh, actuator rod is on the bottom of the gearbox and that can be seen through the inspection hole on the bottom of the fuselage. Uh, the next check I'm going to do is we're going to retract the landing gear electrically and we want to go from all the way down to all the way up in one shot. That way there um, we get the proper dynamic brake adjustment when the landing gear is up and that'll allow us to check you know up lock tensions and and other adjustments that you know we need to do to make sure everything is correct. So. Uh, I have here the handle is stowed and we're going to turn the master switch on. I have the throttle in so the horn doesn't wail at us and then I'm going to keep whenever you run the landing gear you keep your finger on the battery master. If anything starts going south shut the power off. Um, so here I'm going to reach across the camera view here and select up. So here we go on three one two three gear coming up. All right, so the landing gear has reached its up limit, and uh, I'm going to turn power off, and we'll move on to checking the uplock cable tension. To check the uplock cable tension, I'm going to be using a Pacific Scientific cable tensiometer, and it's a T5, you can see right here. Um, the way this tensiometer works is the cable gets run between these blocks and you can see you open the, open the lever here and then hook this around the cable and then when you pull this lever over it pushes the center block in here and the amount of pressure that the cable exerts on the center block moves the needle to the, to the setting or to the, the reading. You take this reading then and you come over here to the chart and you look at the different sizes of cable. This is going to be a 16th inch cable. So we'll be in this chart and we're going to find what this reading is on the gauge in this chart here and then compare it over here to the act, you know, the actual tension in pounds. Uh, there are newer things out there on the market. Uh, the guys at the ABS Maintenance Academy, they were using a digital tensiometer. Uh, if I didn't already have this one, I might consider buying one of them. Uh, the reason I haven't is it's, you know, one of expense. The digital ones are quite a bit more expensive than what I have right here, uh, or at least what I paid for what I have here, which I bought used and had calibrated. This here is a closer view of the right landing gear uplock cable, and you can see this is the uplock cable right in here. Uh, the guys at the ABS Maintenance Academy um, recommended just tugging on this cable a little bit like that prior to taking your measurement. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'll get my tensiometer in here and we'll hook the legs of the tensiometer around the cable. And you want to make sure that you're not on either the end or the housing of the cable because that will throw your, your measurement off. Um, but you get it situated in here. and then snap the, the lever shut and I usually do it a couple of times to make sure that it's the same and it looks like it's coming up at 30 on the scale um, which if I look at my scale 
30 on the scale is equal to 50 pounds and the spec is 52 and a half plus 10 minus zero. So this cable tension is slightly on the low side uh, and should probably be adjusted. After checking the right uplock cable tension, I checked the left uplock cable tension, and the left uplock cable tension came in at 56.6 pounds. So um, that one was within the limit. Now the next step is we're back here at the uh, hand crank, and we're going to check the dynamic brake in the up direction. So just like we did before, rotate the handle around until it engages. Only this time we're going to be trying to retract the gear, so we want to go in the clockwise direction. It's going to be this way. So if we're looking here again, you can see right there's the, the bolt, and we're going to try to turn that. And we get just shy of a quarter turn, and our spec is one-eighth to one-quarter, so we're, we're right where we need to be. So I'll bring the handle back about where it was and then rotate it around and uh, it's in the stove position. Uh, the next step I'm going to do is I'm going to extend the landing gear and we can check our down lock tensions and uh, after that we'll, we'll disconnect doors and do up lock, or, you know, do nose gear up lock tension and some of the up lock roller clearance and other, other steps. Um, so I'll shift the camera around so that you guys can see the landing gear come out from the outside and uh, we'll go on to the next step. So I'm up in the airplane and I have the landing gear handle is stowed and I'm going to turn the master switch on and then now I'm going to select down and the landing gear is going to come out. So here we go. And I have a green indication on the landing gear. So for our next inspection we're going to check the down lock tension. And basically what it is, is there's a, pu the push rod we saw up top, it pushes on a leg on this drag strut, or an arm, I guess, if you will, on this drag strut. And as it comes down, when that motor does the last bit of its travel, it compresses a spring on the end of that rod. The end of the rod is allowed to collapse a little bit. So it compresses a spring, and we want to make sure that the spring has enough tension on it. See, if you push up on this, you can see how it, it breaks over center. And that, that's what holds the gear down. And this is over center and, and up against the stop. And it's held that way by that spring. And we want to make sure that it's pushing down hard enough on that. So the way I measure it is I have a Chatillion 80D gauge. Um, these, are, these force gauges aren't made anymore. Uh, if you're going to buy a, um, you know, something now, you want to get a digital gauge that's available on eBay. That's what they were using at the... Maintenance Academy. Um, the the whole the scale is 80 pounds, so at the maximum end of its range, it's 80 pounds. And then this on these old manual gauges, they have an indicator here that shows the maximum that that the uh, scale reached. So you want to slide that up until it contacts the the indicator on the gauge. And then I put a, a wood block over the end so that I can push on it like this. And then the other thing I have, which they weren't really using, they talked about it, but they didn't really use, is I have a little piece of a feeler gauge that I put inside the joint. So you break the joint free, and then you put the feeler gauge in there. And you can see, as I pull on it, it doesn't come out. And then what it'll do is you just kind of wrap the feeler gauge up. You know, I have a rubber band on it. So I take the rubber band and put some tension on the feeler gauge. And then what we're going to do is we'll, we'll push up on the drag strut until the feeler gauge flies out. Um, I find that gives, us, gives me the most repeatable measurement. So here we go. I'm pushing up on the drag strut. And there went the gauge. And for that time I had, looks like... 54 pounds and our spec is 45 to 60 pounds so I would say that's within range usually I'll try 
checking them, you know, a second time because there is some variation and it's easy to, you know, push a little further than, than you intended to the first time. So I'll check it, you know, two or three times just to make sure I'm, I'm within spec. Um, but this one here looks like it's within the range. So I did the left main gear down lock tension check after doing the one that I showed you in the video. And I came up with 51 pounds for the left side. So both the main gear down locks are in spec. Uh, our next step is to check the nose gear down lock tension. And it follows the same method where I'll put a feeler gauge in here and then we're pushing up on the drag strut and measuring the amount of force it takes to break the drag strut free. Uh, on this airplane, this is an earlier airplane. It has the welded steel tube drag strut. Later airplanes have uh, a forged aluminum drag strut assembly and where the two pieces meet together on those forged ones, it's, it's a little bit wider than it is here. And I found with them, if you're doing the feeler gauge trick, that sometimes it'll, it'll be a lot, it'll give you the appearance of it being a lot less tension if the feeler gauge is on one side of the, of the joint versus the other side. So you need to be aware of that when you're doing that test on those airplanes and, and try to average out, the, uh, average out the results so you get the proper adjustment. So uh, I'm gonna push up on the drag strut and put the feeler gauge in just like we did before and then look to um, attach this on these here I'll, I'll run the rubber band up around the centering roller uh, to put some tension on the feeler gauge and then we'll do the same thing we did before where we zero the, uh, the pointer put the little bug up against the, the pointer and then push perpendicular to the joint until the feeler gauge lets go And right there I got, let's see, 58, 60, 62 pounds. And the spec for the nose gear down lock tension is 55 plus. So it's 55 and over for the nose gear down lock tension on this airplane. And I got 62 pounds. So the nose gear down lock tension is good. The next step in our landing gear inspection is to check the uh, uplock roller clearances, the side brace clearance, and the nose gear uplock tension. Uh, before we can do that, we need to disconnect the outboard gear doors so we have access to the parts we need to get at inside the wheel well. Um, so on the main gear, we're going to disconnect these two bolts right here, we'll take apart, and then let the push rods hang down and the gear doors will just hang down straight while we retract the gear. Uh, the nose gear I'll show separately. On the nose gear we want to disconnect this push rod from both the upper and lower end and actually remove it from the airplane. Uh, obviously you'll need to make sure that you keep the left and the right push rod separated so that they can be returned to their original locations. Otherwise, you run the risk of changing the rig of the nose gear doors. Uh, but leaving those, if you were to leave, just disconnect the bottom end like we did on the outboard doors, there's a chance that this rod could get caught up in the landing gear and it could bend, the, bend or damage the rod or the gear. So uh, it's just easier and safer to remove that whole entire rod. So I've disconnected the gear doors and now it's time to retract the landing gear. I have the landing gear handle is stowed, master switch is on, throttle's full, and here we go, gear coming up. Our next step in the inspection is to check the nose gear up lock tension. And the way I do that is I have a string that is connected to my force gauge and I hook that string around the toe pins 
and then pull down on the landing gear leg here. And it's, it's right when it just breaks free from the bumper on the drag strut up here. So I'll hook this up. Go around both of them like that and basically just hang the, the tension, tension gauge or the, the force gauge on it. And then I'll pull straight down and I keep my finger behind the, the gear leg and feel for the moment when the nose gear starts to pull away from the, from the gear leg or from the drag struts right in there. Let me do that again. And we're looking for 30 to 35 pounds with the nose gear doors disconnected. So let me try again here. We'll pull down. And that is 30 pounds right there. That's 30 pounds. Yep, I'm getting 30 pounds when I check it. So that's within the range and uh, there's no adjustment required. Our next check is the uplock roller clearance. So up here, this is the uplock roller up here and uh, it needs to rotate freely, which this one does. And what we're trying to do is we wanna check the clearance between this roller and this piece right here, the up block. So the spec is 10 to 20 thousandths. So you take a feeler gauge and you go between the two parts, the roller and the up block. And you can see here, this is a 10 thousandths feeler gauge. It's not, it doesn't have any drag on it at all. So if we go with a 20 thousandths feeler gauge, there's a little bit of drag on that. Maybe it may be on the loose side. Uh, the guys at, at the ABS Maintenance Academy, they wanted it to be closer to the 20 thousandths end of the range. And, and remember that this side too was a side that had slightly less uplock tension on, on the uh, uplock cable. So that could be related or maybe not, but There's a 22 thousandths gauge, and it, it slides through there a little bit. So I'm gonna say that I probably need to adjust the uplock cable tension on this side, and then recheck the uplock clearance. And if it still seems a little big, then maybe back it, back it up to uh, 20 thousandths, or just under 20 thousandths of an inch. Uh, once you have the uplock clearance done, the next uh, thing to check while we're here is the side brace clearance. And what we're looking for is basically up on top of the drag strut here, the clearance between, or the, not the drag strut, but the side brace. The clearance between the side brace and the top skin, it needs to be at least a sixteenth of an inch. And usually what I'll do there is just stack up some feeler gauges and uh, see what I get going through there. And, and the way you do that is you come in up along the skin with the feeler gauge and you just slide it across and it's clearly got enough clearance there. Um, there's no issue um, in that area. And then one more check which is just off the camera view. It's right up here in the corner is the up stop bolt and you just want to make sure that that bolt is contacting so what you do there is you um, take the thinnest or one of the thinnest feeler gauges you have and see if it'll slip through the the or if it'll go between the bolt and the gear leg so i'm trying to slide it through and it will not go through so that that adjustment seems fine the other side, we got to move over to the other side and do the same things on the other side. Um, I won't show them just for, for time's sake, but 
it's the same check on the opposite side. So I checked the left main uplock roller clearance and it was at 14 thousandths of an inch which is within spec but albeit a little bit on the tighter side than we would like um, but still good and the uh, side brace pin clearance to the skin clearance is also good and the up stop bolt was good so now we need to run the landing gear out so we can check the squat switch and just for the heck of it I'm going to do that manually uh, to show you that process so if you had an electrical system failure uh, you would have down selected albeit there's no power uh, and you're going to want to manually crank the landing gear out so just like we did for our uh, dynamic brake clearance check you bring the handle out and you engage it and then we're going to turn it in a counterclockwise direction until the landing gear is all the way out so here we go And that's pretty well about 51 turns. And you can see as I pull on the handle, it's at the internal stop. So we rotate it back, lock the, or stow the handle. And then I'll turn power on and we'll see if we have a green light. And indeed, we do have a green light indicating the landing gear is down and locked. So our next check is the squat switch. And uh, we're looking at the right main landing gear. This airplane here, since it's an earlier airplane, only has one squat switch. Later airplanes have one on each landing gear, or on each main gear, and I check those separately. Uh, but I'll walk you through the procedure here for the right main gear on this airplane. Um, so we're looking at the strut, and up here is the squat switch. And you can see it's got an arm with a push rod coming down to the upper torque link. The way this works is pretty simple. Uh, when the weight of the airplane is on the gear, the strut is compressed and this switch is open. When you take off and the weight comes off of the gear, the, uh, the lever gets pulled down and compresses the switch and that allows the, the landing gear to be act activated. Um, so the check, the way you check it is you take the pin out of the bottom and then you lift up on the switch or on the arm and then select up. Uh, and basically when you're in the cockpit, you know, turn the master on, select up and keep your hand on the master. You should have, you know, a horn blow or the gear at a minimum shouldn't go. It, it varies by year what function is included in each switch. Um, but the gear should not retract if either one of the, of the um, squat switches is not made or in this case if the only squat switch is not made. So uh, we'll go up and try the gear and, uh, you know, see what happens. So the landing gear uh, squat switch is disconnected. We're up in the cockpit and uh, so here's the procedure for checking it. I, I turn on the master switch and uh, you keep your finger on the master switch in case the gear starts to move um, and shut it off right away. So here we go. I'm going to select up and uh, see what happens. And as you can hear, the warning horn was going off. That's to let you know that uh, the gear is in an unsafe condition. Um, that would happen if you were on the ground. Uh, again, we'll try it again here just so you can see. When you select up, the horn will blow. So select down and we'll turn it off. Then we just need to reconnect the squat switch and uh, finish out our inspection. This is the nose gear shimmy dampener, and uh, it's this cylinder right here. And there's a simple check to uh, check the fluid level in the shimmy dampener. And what you do is you take a 16th inch diameter rod and you run it up through the back of the, uh, of the center shaft. And you hold your, your thumb at it to indicate how far in it went. And then you measure the length of the rod that went into the shimmy dampener, and here I got three and three sixteenths of an inch and my notes here say that it's empty if it's three and three six or three and one sixteenth inch 
and it's full if it goes in 2 and 3 16th inch. So this shimmy dampener is most likely empty or at least very under serviced with fluid. And so it either needs to be rebuilt and serviced or it can be replaced with a fluidless type uh, shimmy dampener that's available through Lord. On the top right hand side of the gearbox over top of where the hand crank shaft is, is the oil fill port for the landing gear box. And you can see down inside this oil fill port, I'll try to get a pointer here, down inside this port you can see that shaft in there with the threads on it. That's the worm gear for the, the hand crank. And so I have the hand crank engaged right now. And there's two ways of, of checking the fluid level. You can either take a plastic dipstick like a, a wire tie stem and insert it down in there and see if you have some fluid on it. Or the other way is to rotate the shaft. And the, the, correct, the correct service level is the bottom of the shaft. So it should just pick up the fluid as you rotate the shaft around. And I'll, I'll do that right now. So here I'm turning the, the shaft and you can see it pulls the, the brownish color gear oil up onto the shaft. So this, this gearbox's fluid level is properly serviced. And that concludes this video. I encourage you to check out the American Bonanza Society's Landing Gear Inspection and Repair Guide. That guide covers more information and more checks than are covered in this video. And uh, if you're doing an inspection on one of these systems, you should follow all of the procedures covered in that guide as well as in the aircraft service manual. I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video and I'll check back with you soon. Thanks.